Good evening. Welcome to a uh, Ngong Peng public lecture organized by the Institute for Mathematical Sciences (IMS) at NUS. My name is Zhu Chengbo, and I'm deputy director of IMS. I will start by briefly introducing our Institute IMS, its main activities. So IMS, founded in, two, in the year 2000, is a university-level research institute dedicated to the fostering of mathematical research, both fundamental and multidiscipline. The mission of IMS is to link mathematics with other disciplines, nurture the growth of mathematical expertise, train talent for research in the mathematical sciences, and provide a platform for research interaction and the collaboration between scientific community in Singapore and a wider international community. In carrying out its mission, IMS organized CMET research program lasting from one to three months, which incorporate uh, workshop and tutorials and chosen from area at the forefront of current research in the mathematical sciences and their applications. IMS organ also organized conferences, a standalone workshop focusing on specific topics, as well as distinguished lecture in the summer schools. As part of this outreach program, IMS organized public lectures like the one today, as well as school lectures. Through these means, IMS seeks to raise public awareness and understanding of the law of mathematics in science, engineering, technology, and industry and commerce, and to encourage talented students in the study of mathematics, leading to research careers in the mathematical sciences and their wide applications. Now let me introduce our distinguished guest today, Professor Jila Ben Arush, of Koran Institute of Mathematical Sciences, New York University. Professor Ben Arus is a Silver Professor of Mathematics at NYU, specializing in stochastic analysis and application to mathematical physics, to mathematical data science, and artificial intelligence. He studied mathematics at Econ Normal Superior and received his PhD from Palace 7. He has held many lead leadership positions, both in NYU and prior to NYU. In particular, he founded the Bernoulli Center in EPFL and served as the director of the Koran Institute in NYU. Professor Ben Arus has had a highly illustrated career with numerous distinctions, including the Low Davidson Prize, the Meddling Lecturer of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, and Invite Speaker of the International Congress of Mathematicians, and a Plenary Speaker at the European Congress of Mathematicians. Just to name a few, Professor Ben Arus is a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics and uh, elected member of the International Statistics Institute, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a member of the United States National Academy of Sciences. So without any further ado, please welcome Professor Ben Arus to deliver today's public lecture, Beating the Odds, that's the short form. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this nice introduction. Thank you for being here in this beautiful uh, room. And so I will talk about this, uh, a little bit about the mathematics of data. So first, what we're doing here, this public lecture is part of the conference, the mathematics of data, which is organized at the IMS by Afonso Bandera from Zurich, Subro Ghosh is here, Philippe Rigolet is here, and Hong Chu. And um, it runs two workshops during this month of January with uh, some of the very best experts on two of the most current topics on the mathematical aspects of data science, optimization and discrete structures, and optimal transport and PDEs. But, but I've been asked to give this public check, make this public lecture accessible to first year university students. So if all goes well, this is not a lecture for my dear colleagues. And if I look here, I don't see that many, maybe there are, first year PhD students. Um, so of course, this is always the trap of those things. You, you, I respected the game here. I prepared for first year PhD student who maybe know what a derivative is. Um, 
So, but I think that the, the public is not exactly that. So if you are a student, please stop me when needed. If you're a colleague, just uh, enjoy if you can. Uh, all right, so uh, during this lecture, I will try to explain very cursorily what two of the main goals of data science or artificial intelligence are, learning and generating, okay? So first I will go, ver because I'm supposed to talk to first year students, cursorily to the, to the very long history of these subjects from probability theory to statistics. Well, these two goals have been called differently. Learning is, of course, the same word as estimating. And uh, generating is the same word as sampling. And these words have been used in statistics for a long time. So then after I've, I've done that to, to this uh, imaginary first year student, um, I will describe very briefly what AI is doing today at a very elementary level and how mathematics is trying to help. Much of this brings new and hard questions, which are not covered by the classical theory of uh, probability, uh, uh, statistics, and all that. And uh, I will insist mostly on the mysteries hidden in high dimensions, because that's the, if you take a geometric point of view on this thing, this is really what's behind, the interesting part for us mathematicians behind this. It's, uh, things are different in high dimensions. Okay, so statistical inference 101. So assume that you have a coin. Is there a way to know the probability of heads or tails when you toss it? I'm sure you do know that. So the answer is obvious. Of course, you toss a very large number of times, say m times. You count how many times you have, uh, you get heads and divide by m. And this should be, give you the empirical frequency of heads. And when m is large, this uh, large enough, this should be close to the true probability. So this story has been around for a very long time. In fact, it goes back to this law of large number. It goes back to the 16th century and uh, Cardano, which in fact did it in the 16th century, but published it only in the 17th. Interestingly, you know, in those years and you know, those centuries, people would do things and not publish, keep it, which we don't do that anymore. So, <laughs> and it was done in the 17th century by one of the Bernoullis, Jacob. Uh, again, it was done in, uh, in, in the 17th century, but published only at the beginning of the 18th one, by, in Ars Conjectendi. And in fact, this goes back to the question raised by Pierre de Fermat and Blaise Pascal in 1654 for this unfinished game problem. So all that is, you see, very, very old. So what was the... Why were people interested in this story? What was the unfinished game problem? It was simple. You and I play, and there is a certain... So maybe you, you, you bet on heads, I bet on tail, and we play a certain number of time. We put the bets, and at some point we have to interrupt the game. What is the fair way to share the money? Okay, that's the unfinished game problem. So if you... And... Um, and of course, for that, so Blaise Pascal, not Fermat, in fact, uh, really understood the story and understood the law of large number and much more. If you know a bit Blaise Pascal, you realize that this is at the heart of what was called the Pascal ledger, the Paris de Pascal. And so then you also realize what was the real motivation behind this. It was certainly not game theory. Nobody cared about coin tossing and dice tossing. The whole story here about, was about, is there a proof of the existence of God? That's what Pascal and Fermat was, were interested in. And the money that you share was exactly the Pascal ledger. That is, you know, if you bet, uh, what is the best bet you can do? And you know what the, Pascal's answer was. And a few weeks after this, Pascal had this famous night of fire where, where he had a mystical vision and then became extremely religious and, uh, and abandoned mathematics. So, you know, studying probability is dangerous. So <laughs> that was, uh, of course, rapidly followed by a more general version of the law of large number, not only reduced to a coin tossing. So, of course, this law of large number says repeat a random experiment n times independently, and then the empirical mean, the mean that you get in your 
random experiment is close to the true mean when m is large. That's the law of large number. So, the, 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 of course, this is this is the basis of of the whole Western revolution in science. Right? It means there is a way from experiments to understand reality. Right? That's what this means. Reality is not accessible directly, but you do enough experiments, you get it. That's that's essentially what this tells you. Then, of course, you need to answer another question with, okay, this is closed, but, um, oh, wait, this is closed, but how close? And then, of course, the, what is the, the error you make when you look at the empirical thing compared to the true thing? And this, of course, is given by the central limit theorem, as we call it now. And this was for, so first by Abraham de Moivre in 33, in the context of coin tossing again. And uh, Bram de Moivre was the first who got this Gaussian fluctuation. And this was uh, the first time this limiting universal distribution of fluctuations was introduced, which later was called, of course, uh, the Gaussian distribution by the Germans, the normal distribution by the, the English, who did not want to call it the Gauss distribution, and, of course, the de Moivre Laplace by the French. And uh, because it was invented by de Moivre and Laplace, not by Gauss and not by normal. Um, I don't know, but that's you know, who, who knows Mr. Normal. So anyway, the, the, it was clearly said that it was a you know it was a time where this tension between the, the three big math schools were important. But anyway, this proof was really done by De Moivre. Interestingly, if you look at the proof by De Moivre, I mean the results by De Moivre, he had to mention the convergence to the Gaussian. We all know. I don't. I will not write an, a, any formula because I'm supposed to. Um, again, remember, I'm talking to first-year students here. So we all know the formula for Gaussian. There was an exponential in it. Remember that at this point in time, De Moivre could not even denote it exponential by exponential x. This goes to Euler, which is after De Moivre, right? So he had formula which were, uh, which were really complicated, but he really understood this uh, limiting thing. Anyway, so, uh, this is of course the central limit theorem and, and then, of course, it was seen to be valid for much more general context by Laplace, essentially. In 1803, this big book, and his, in fact, in 1794, in his class at École Polytechnique, and then later by Gauss. And here, that, since, as I said, since there is no English contribution, uh, this is what's called normal. <laughs> then, this type of results opened the way, of course, for the basic uh, questions of statistics for the next three centuries. How do we find information in a large sample? I will be, of course, I will not do the whole thing for you know, now. And of course, you, the story is you want to understand something, a phenomenon, you start by, you start by identifying a few parameters which seem to rule the structure. That's the important thing. You have some scientific understanding of what you have to look at. And then you make enough experiments to estimate these few parameters and fix the size of the sample from the level of precision you need. Since you have the central limit theorem that tells you what the, the error will be, if you want to fix the size of the error, this gives you the size of the sample you need. So you need a, a, a large sample if you want a small error. And, uh, but of course here, remember, this, there is still a scientific thing behind that. You don't do a random experiment. You, 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 you identify a few parameters in the distribution you're looking at. And this is what you want to follow. So the last step, of course, uh, this last step of this level of precision is, of course, where probability theory is useful from the central limit theorem, where I just said, or large deviation, concentration results. The long story. Then, of course, I won't go there because that's one of, not one of the tasks I mentioned. But, of course, once you understand how to estimate, you could try to test uh, you know, can I really deduce information from my experiment? For instance, can I say with a probability of error less than something that the mean of this population is larger than the mean of that population? That is, for instance, that my medical treatment did something, right? So this is, of course, crucial things. And uh, so that's, maybe that's the first task, sampling and then maybe uh, testing. Something more recent, it has been sampling, which is very, of course, build a large 
sample of a given distribution. This was done essentially for numerical things, essentially in World War II, and essentially for physics and nuclear physics. So build, so build a large sample of a given distribution, given some type of information on this distribution. So what kind of information you, would you have? For instance, you have in a simple mathematical models you teach, to, let's say second year level students, to you next year, um, typically you have a complete analytical expression of the density. Maybe you have much less than that. Maybe you have some constraint on this distribution. It has to belong to something where with certain distance, something else, whatever. Some moments should be bounded by something. So you have constraints on the distribution and you want to optimize something, but then you want to, that's what you know. That's the class of the distribution. And you want to sample from a distribution there. Or you may, for instance, you may have a small sample of your distribution, right? You have a sample of the size 100, but you want to have a sample of size 10,000, right? How do you do that? And of course, if you go back to the original problem, the distribution of a coin or a coin toss or a dice toss, you could just toss one, right? As in Monte Carlo, you can just play. That's why these things are called Monte Carlo. So, of course, in many situations, you could do a real experiment to sample. You could really go to the physics world or the biological world to create a larger sample, right? Uh, but sometimes you don't, you cannot do that and you still have this thing. You have the data and you want to have a good sample because that will be important for your statistical tasks. So an important question here is why do we want to sample? Right? That's always never to be forgotten. And what are, in particular, this implies the next question, which is what are the criteria of quality for our sampling? How do we say that the sampling is good? Right? We're just not simply simple, sample. Okay, so this is the classical regime of statistics, right? This, this scientific enterprise has been enormously successful for 3,000 years, and the body of knowledge is huge, and the points of view are many, of course, for instance, Bayesian versus frequentist to take the old thing and many other things. So the, uh, every statistician, engineer, scientist, mathematician learns some doctor, medical doctor learns some of that. And so you will too, probably. I'm enjoying that. Of course, this, the, the success of this uh, story has been uh, directly related to the increase in computing power, right? What you could do at the time of uh, Pascal or Fermat or whatever was very little. Of course, in the meantime, computing power has become enormous and this goes with the progress of that and of course explains why we have so many new and interesting problems. But, and in particular, all that was done in a given regime, which is I call the classical regime. So the given regime is the, 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 the number of parameters you want to estimate, the dimension in which you're working, is small. Five. Okay? And, but you want, but you have a large sample. Let's say M, the number of, of sample, the number of measurement is 10,000. So this means you have access to a, this long experiment, this large experiment, and you want to estimate something in small dimension. All these theorems are essentially valid in this type of thing. Of course, we all know that there are um, extension to that. But the, the recent progress of artificial intelligence, neural nets, and all that, and data science, is not in this regime. Okay, so uh, this is important to understand. We we tend the the the, the regime of artificial intelligence is typically you want to estimate something in high dimension. And you don't have that much of a large sample. You have big data, but not enormous sampling samples. Right? So this is a different thing. So here is a very, very simple example, my pet example, so that you see. And it's not here, I'm, I will not, for the moment, there's no artificial intelligence, no neural net, no whatever. It's purely statistics. So imagine you have a vector, V, in Rn in n dimension. And let's say it's unit. So it's, it, the norm is fixed, it's norm one. This is not important, you could not fix the norm, but that's... Okay, and you want to estimate it, you want to learn it. Okay, so that's the task. 
learn this vector. But what do you have? You have data. So in all, all statistics, all data science, all machine learning, the first thing you have to look at is what is the task and what is the data to do it before you do anything. So here the data is, let's say, you observe a noisy version of the, the tensor power of it. You look at V to the power P tensor, right? So it's a rank one thing, but you look at the ten, you just have access to V power three, let's say. Okay? So you know what this tensor is. What is the tensor, the three tensor? It's a cube of numbers, right? Which is made and so it's, uh, you know, it's i, j, k component is v, i, v, j, v, k. Right? Very simple. So that's how you have access to this vector. And you don't even have access by somebody giving you the tensor, but you have access to a noisy version of the tensor. Right? So you observe this tensor plus Gaussian noise. So this is what is written here. What you have access to is a sample I call TI, like tensor. I is between 1 and M. So you have this the sample size is M. And you observe this, tens this tensor of rank 1, the simplest possible tensor, V to the power P, plus Z, ZIs, where the ZIs are IID, standard Gaussian tensors. Right? So the Z are made, it's a block, let's say P equal 3, it's again a block of a cube of numbers, right? And each entry of this thing are IID standard Gaussians, all right? So you have access to that, and I added here uh, this thing, uh, lambda, which is, I call the signal-to-noise ratio. Of course, you could have put 1 over lambda in front of Z. That would have been the same thing. So this is just like the variance of your noise. So when lambda is large, it means you have a small noise. Okay, so large signal to noise ratio means small noise. So uh, I, that's what you have access to. That's your experiment, your access to the word, and you want to observe, to, to, to learn, estimate, this unknown vector v. All right, very simple task. Okay, that's a, my pet task because that's how I got into all these questions. Because this, it doesn't look like it, but this is linked to statistical physics of spin glasses. So, this is how I jumped in this world. But it's a very nice example to start because it's complicated and we all like complicated things. So, lambda is the signal to noise ratio. And the question, the question here is, can you do it? Can you learn V? I give you this sample. Can you learn V? So, of course, you can in the classical regime where the number of parameters, n, the dimension of V, is fixed, is 5. And M is huge, goes to infinity. So if you observe this in dimension 5, then and you have 10,000 uh, sample, then you can. But what if, in fact, this N is large, and maybe you don't have enough M, enough data to do that? So... What about the case where n is large? So that's the real question here. n is tending to infinity. How large should be m? How much data must do you need to do that? Okay. How much data do you need to learn in high dimension? So if p is 1, this is a very simple problem. That is, I'm just looking at the vector plus a random Gaussian. Everybody, even in first year, has done regression, right? That's that simple. The story here is that when p is larger or equal to 3, this is a hard problem. When p is 2, that is when you're looking at matrices, it's kind of a critical problem. So you have different questions, of course. First, can you do it from an information theory point of view? That is, what is the information theory point of view? You have the distribution of your the tensor you observe the noisy thing, with a signal. And you could look at the distribution of this tensor when the signal is not there, when lambda is zero, when it's pure noise. All these two distribution, their distance, in whatever you choose, for instance, total variation, which you will learn sometime. <laughs> uh, is this distance 
too small. If this distance goes to zero, then you have no way. Information theoretically, there is no way to compute something that will distinguish those two distribution. Okay, so that's the first question. The next question, imagine you can, right? Then how do you do it? So information theoretically, you can. So there is a, a procedure somewhere, a statistical procedure. What is the statistical procedure you should choose? So for instance, if you choose the plain vanilla statistical procedure, which is what everybody does, maximum likelihood estimation, in particular in a Gaussian context like this, it's pretty simple to write the likelihood. Um, does that work in this regime, right? So, and then if the statistical procedure, so what does it mean it works? It means if you find the, min, the maximum likelihood estimator, it should be close to the vector V that you're trying to find. But then when you do a maximum likelihood, uh, is it computationally feasible? Because to do a maximum likelihood, you have to compute a maximum. So you have to do an optimization algorithm. That's the third level. First, information theory, second, statistics, and third, uh, optimization. Does this optimization thing work easily? How long do you have to run it? Okay. So here are three answers. So there is a regime when you, where you cannot learn. So there is a regime here when n is large, where the, when the, the signal to noise ratio is too small, which means when the noise is too large, smaller than a certain threshold, which I call here lambda IT for information theory, then you cannot learn. There is nothing you can do. The distance in total variation between these two distances goes to zero. You simply cannot even detect that there is a signal, right? Much less estimate it. So you cannot learn it. Right? You cannot even know that there is something to learn. When you can learn, that is when you're above this uh, information theory threshold, so how could you choose a statistical procedure? If you're just uh, lazy and you choose the simplest one, in this case, the maximum likelihood, it works. As soon as you can learn, you can learn with the simplest method. Okay. But... To solve the optimization problem, so to do something concrete, practical, you need a much larger SNR. In fact, you need a, 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 a signal to noise ratio which is larger by a factor n to the p minus 2 over 2 than the threshold. So you have a gap between the information theory of the statistics threshold and the computational threshold, which is huge. When p is 3, this is n to the power 1 half. And so when n is large, this can be a huge gap. Okay? This means you need, it's easy to see that this means you need a much larger, a polynomially larger number of data points. You need much more experiments, many more. Okay? So this big gap. So all, here I describe the stupidest way that you, anybody would try, right? Maximum likelihood and whatever. Stochastic gradient descent to optimize. But in fact, all the local methods have the same threshold, whether you do approximate message passing, Langevin, gradient flow, SGD, they all fail at the same place. There are many other methods which work above a lower threshold, which is m to the p minus 2 over 4, which is still a, a diverging gap, like sums of square, tensor and folding. I won't go there. And then now I'm remembering that you don't know what that means. But uh, So that's, uh, but still it's a diverging thing. Knowing whether Nothing seems to work under, the, under this threshold. So, there, so under this threshold between the lambda it and this threshold, you know that your, let's say, your maximum likelihood estimator is good, but you just cannot compute it. Okay, so there, and this big gap here is for the moment, everybody seems to believe that, so everybody comes up with a new, a new algorithm and it always fails at the same threshold. Right? So here there is something for the for computer scientists. Of course, this smells like uh, theoretical computer science. But for the moment, this is really open to understand why everything fails at the same place. Okay. 
So this big example here of uh, this sim very trivial example of uh, of um, uh, you know a statistical problem we should keep in mind because for this you don't need machine learning you don't need a GPU you just understand. So by the way, why is it so difficult to 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 find this? So let me explain that. I, I wanted a, a blackboard, but there's none, and I don't know how to draw this here. So I will draw things with my hands. So here you are, so what's the problem? You have your vector, which is unknown, on the sphere, right? It's a unit vector. So let's imagine so that I can draw it with my hands that it's the North Pole. And the sphere is, the, is here, right? So you don't know that it's the North Pole and you're trying to find it. All right. And so you observe this, uh, Thing. You do your maximum likelihood. You have a certain function to maximize or minimize, if you put a negative sign, the log likelihood. It happens that in this case, this function you want to minimize is simply a random polynomial of, of uh, a, a random polynomial, homogeneous polynomial of degree three, if you compute, plus a very simple polynomial. Let me call x1 this coordinate. It would be a constant and x1 to the cube. So you have on the on, on one hand a very uh, generic random polynomial of degree three, and on the other hand a very simple polynomial x one to the cube, and you add the two, right? And you want to and you try to minimize this and try to find the North Pole, but and then you do whatever you want Langevin uh, gradient descent stochastic gradient descent. Why does it not work? Of course it does work if you wait an exponential time in n. But nobody will run a computer for 10 to the 10 to the 9 steps. So this is where all the questions about you know mixing times and all that the time is really important here. And so that because it's the number of steps. So let's say you even take the uh, the exact opposite of the gradient method. Now I'm not talking to first year student. You take uh, let's say online SGD. So then the number of steps is essentially the number of data points you have. It takes precisely this uh, polynomial time, number of steps to get there. Why? So of course it depends where you start your algorithm. If you start with a warm start, so here's the sphere. A warm start means you start in the northern hemisphere because you want to go to the North Pole. Okay, somewhere there. If you start there, Things will be simple. Oh, that does not apply. Very simple. But the question is, how do you start there? How do you start? How do you initialize? You, the only thing you can do if you know nothing is to initialize randomly. So if you take a point at random on the sphere in high dimension, that's where we go to high dimension, you start on the equator. I think it's perfectly fit to mention that here because we are on the equator here, essentially. So you start on the equator, very close to the equator, right? If you take a point at random, whatever this vector is, you will start in high dimension. You start, in fact, on the equator with very high probability. The probability to start in the northern hemisphere by very simple large deviation is exponentially small, small in n. So you start at the equator. And the equator is, of course, when I draw this picture, your mind doesn't see it as mine can't either. We cannot see in dimension the million. But in fact, this dimension two or three thing is completely misleading. The way one should think, because of course when I do this, the equator seems to be very small. And I want to go there. But in fact, the way you should think of it is as a flat surface, this whole flat surface is the equator and the two hemispheres are two tiny, tiny holes. Right? Because they have a very small mass. You start at random in this big thing, and you try to find one of them. Okay, so uh, the way to be able to find them is to have a strong enough drift, which pushes gradient, if you want, which pushes you to this thing, and this is where you need a strong signal to noise ratio or a lot of data. Okay, so let's understand this. So this is what you have in what one should have in mind. So before, so this is a very simple example. Uh, in high dimension where you already feel some of the mysteries of high dimension, right? Which is, 
is hard to escape entropy. It's hard to escape mediocrity, right? When you start at the equator, it's mediocre. Your performance is very bad. To get it just to be a little good is the real problem. To be, to be better than average is super hard in high dimension. So anyway, so first a very schematic and simplistic view of neural nets. So what are neural nets for those who don't know? Again, this is a little ironic, but uh, so you start with a, the important thing is to understand what you really cannot escape from. Not only is the equator, but you start with a data set. You have data and you have a sample, let's say of M IID random variable in RD, D is the dimension of the data distributed under some unknown distribution. That's always statistics. And you have a task. The task, so you have the data and you have the task. The task is estimating some feature, some, something about this distribution, right? Like I said before, estimating the probability of heads or tails. Okay. So this task is what you really want to do with your data science, right? Understanding the risk of this or that disease, given this or that biology. But then, so for here is another more interesting, I mean, the usual way we people take, for instance, of classification. You have M pictures, and you want to classify them into pictures which include a cat and the pictures which do not include a cat. Or you have M pictures of, of digits, handwritten digits, and you want to classify them into 10 classes from 0 to 9. Now, the real question is, how will you judge the quality of your statistical tool? So, of course, the way to, to understand that is to generalize to another such image. So you take another image from the same distribution and not used in this training phase, and you check what your algorithm decides. So the, if the algorithm says there is a cat and there is no cat, that's an error. And you call generalization error a measure of the probability to make an error there. Okay. So that's the... So you have these two things. You have the data that you use. And of course, you want to use the data, to, the data to, at some point, generalize to something you haven't yet seen. That's, of course, what we all do with science. So, and the generalization error is the important thing, that you want to be small. But the, uh, important to understand that what is given to you is the data and the task, not the procedure. You can do whatever you want in between. So... If you want to learn, so what you want to do here is learn, let's say in this very simple classification task, if you want to learn a function that sends, let's say, your image, all the pixels of your image, to a yes or no answer, for instance, the binary classification to cat or no cat. Or let's say to an answer in the set 0, 1, 2, 9, to tell you this is a 0, this is a 2, this is a 3, whatever. And you want that with a minimal error, okay, when you generalize. Okay, so the great idea of machine learning is to do that through a special class of functions which are defined by neural networks. Okay, so you want to learn a function. This function is there. This function that says there is a cat or there is no cat, right? But you want to approximate it by functions that are defined through in a very specific way. So this idea of approximating complicated functions through very simple ones is very old, of course. We all we all know that. It's, uh, it goes back, let's say, it's a basis of harmonic analysis. It's you know, what you do with, when you do a Fourier expansion. You have a complicated function, you expand it, you will take its Fourier transform, which means that you reduce it to very simple things. And so the, but here the difference is that the class of approximating function is very, or you know, when you do wavelets or whatever, here the class of approximation function is very different. And of course, there are theorems which tell you something like, Every reasonable function is approximative. Is, uh, you can approximate it by its Fourier series. So you have something of the same nature, which is called universal approximation theorem, for this very specific class. But this class, for people who don't do, have not done machine learning, the first time you see that, you say, this is crazy. What, what, how did people think of this class of function? So here it is, how you define this class of function. So what is a neural net? It's a graph, weighted graph, each vertex you think of it as a neuron. It's supposed to be a caricature of the brain, which it is not. And each edge between two vertices is a synapse, which comes with a weight, a number, a real number, which measures the strengths, if you want, of this link. And each neuron gathers 
a linear combination of the outputs of its neighbors on the graph given by the weights oh, I forgot them. And, and, and you know the, the linear combination given by the weights of the outputs of the neighbors and then apply to, to this a nonlinear transformation to this linear combination. This nonlinear transformation is usually given by what is called an activation function, which can be of different, the relu function, the whatever, the logistic, the what, whatever function you like. So here it's a function of one variable. Okay? So that's what a neural net is. And you have internal vertices or neurons as well as you have vertices that are, that are related to the outside of the network. So input vertices, where you enter the information, the data, and output vertices, where you get the information. So you input vertices, you put the image, the output vertex here would tell you, yes, no, there is a cat or there's no cat, okay? And in the middle, you have this. So the architecture of this graph can be very, you have very, a lot of variance, but uh, I won't get into that. So this is the function defined by the neural net. You enter something at the input things, and then you linearly combine on all these edges, apply the, the activation function at each internal node, and look at what comes outside. Okay, very, very uh, uh, simple thing. And so, um, of course, now you say you want to classify cats, pictures of cats or not, then you want to, to find a function, you want to the best possible approximation that fits as well as possible the values you have in your sample. So what does it mean fit as well as possible? You choose the metric in which you will compare these two things, right? So in Fourier, typically, of course, we would take an L2 thing, but here you could take whatever else, okay? All that, so here are the steps. You specify the task, you gather the data, here are the picture of cats, you build your neural net, you choose the architecture of the graph, then you choose the, a way to measure this quality of your classification, the loss function, and then you have a minimization problem to solve. You want to minimize the loss as a function of the set of your parameters of your neural net. The parameters here are just these weights, and the weights that you've done there. So if your graph is big, the number of weights is enormous. So, I don't know, 10 to the 9. Okay? The question here you have, you end up having here is minimizing a function of 10 to the 9 uh, variable. Minimizing a random function of 10 to the 9 variable. Why is it random? Because it's random because of the data. Right? So, how do you do this optimization problem? You don't have many other ways than do the usual thing, gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, etc. And of course, you, you need, this is where you need huge, in fact, compute, um, computing resources, okay? Typically GPU. As long as machine learning was work, trying to work with CPUs, it was not doing what it can do now. So, note that if the number of parameters that you want to estimate is small, this is very close to the classical regime. Right? So if your network, your graph is tiny, you have a, a few edges, you're back, so the number of parameters is the number of edges, essentially, the number of weights, you're back to what we used to do, small number of parameters. Maybe if you have large enough data, you can do it. So optimization in small dimension can be small, in the non can be complicated in the, and not completely controlled in the non-convex case, but it's still very classical, central topic, I won't go there. Here, the, the neural net way chosen here seems completely crazy. The recipe here is do it with an enormous number of parameters. Use what is called over-parameterization and the system works, sometimes. So what does the sometimes work? It means that when it doesn't work, Google doesn't tell you. They just throw the training away and start again. Okay, so, but of course, the only thing we see is, is the success stories, the things that work. So, this is of course very bizarre. If you think of it, this is something strange here. Why does it work? When does it work? For what data structure? And more importantly, for what architecture? That's really the engineering task, not for mathematicians typically. We tend to work after the engineers. The engineers come and say, do this, and we work 20 years to prove that doing this is reasonable. 
But here we could be a little more ambitious in the end. Maybe we could try to kill uh, artificial intelligence. That is, try to understand the principle that should give us a good architecture. This is a meta question which is way above what we all can do. Right? What we can do typically as mathematicians is study simple networks and try to understand what's happening. Right? But we can't even, we don't even do this meta search which is uh, to under, try to understand what would be the best architecture for, for this or that problem given the data structure. Given the distribution that we're of the sample. Nobody knows, I mean, at least I don't know how to really approach this. So, other questions? How much data do you need? How long, how long do you have to run the optimization algorithm? SGD, for instance. Like in the example I was giving you, the simple example of tensor PCA, what was the real difficulty? And with what hyperparameters? What batch size in SGD? What step size? What, how, what initialization? How do you do that? Okay, all these are problems that a lot of people are working on, a lot of results, but still far from being uh, established, at least from what I know. And what can go wrong? A priori, everything can go wrong. Who is crazy enough to, to on purpose, make the problem untractable by taking a very large number of variables to optimize? So what can go wrong is that you can get lost in high dimension. Right? So that's what I describe in the tensor PCA thing. So at this A, at this stage, somebody has given you the task and the day, or you have the task and the data. Somebody has given you the architecture of your network. The loss function is determined and you're trying to minimize and you're an expert in optimization. You use whatever you want as a pro, as a optimization algorithm. So, but you have to minimize an empirical loss function. A loss function, which is built on the data, empirical, and which is a random function, because it's built on the data, of a large number of parameters. So you have a function on a high dimensional space, which I call n here, the number of weights in your graph, which is random. And now minimize it. So we've seen an example of that when I was discussing the tensor PCA thing. You had this random polynomial, it was a very simple function, random polynomial of degree three, plus plus a rank one perturbation. Of course, here I'm cheating. I'm saying this function is very simple. In fact, when I know that a random polynomial of degree three in n variable is extremely complicated. Okay? So topologically, the, the shape of the landscape of a polynomial in deg of degree uh, of, uh, th three, a homogeneous polynomial in, in a, a thousand variable is extremely complicated. It has an exponentially large number of local minima, of critical points. The topology, the Morse theory of its level set, oh sorry, you don't know Morse theory yet, but <laughs> the Morse theory of its level sets is very, very complicated. So it's, in fact, it's not because you describe it by saying it's a polynomial of degree three, a cubic polynomial, that it becomes simple. In fact, it's a very complicated story. But typically, we will see that random function of many variables tend to be complicated. So we are in a high dimensional space. We have a random function. We want to find the minimum. So are these random functions topologically, as I just said, simple or complex? Do they have many local minima? Do they have many critical points? What about the topology of their level sets? That's a very important question. There is a lot of activity in this direction. So hard to say in general, but yes, they are complicated, as I just said, in simple example, like the tensor PCA problem that I mentioned before. Okay, so these functions are indeed very complicated. It's hard to do for general neural nets. It has been done in a few cases, but I will, I will mention a bit more of that. So that's called the topological complexity. So this toolkit, as I say here, is not at the level of first year student. So it relies on the katz rice formula, which allows you to compute this topology in terms of the distribution of the Hessian of the function at a point conditioned by the fact that this point is critical. So if you think of it, the Hessian is a random, because the function is random, so here it's a random matrix, real symmetric, in high dimension, n by n, Gaussian, if the, in the tensor PCA thing, because things are Gaussian, in general non-Gaussian. 
So you have this very large random matrix. You look at the distribution, conditioned by critical. So it's naturally a question about, uh, about random matrices. And the question here is essentially about when you look, okay, you have to believe me, but it's essentially about the edge of the spectrum of those very large random matrices. Okay, and this has been studied for a long while. We have enough info in the simple cases to do that. This has been done in some cases of uh, neural nets, but the difficulty there is that this, uh, I just mentioned the Katz-Rice formula, which says you have to compute the conditional expectation of a Hessian given a gradient. When everything is Gaussian, computing conditional expectation is simple. When things are not Gaussian, this is hard. The formula is still valid, but extracting information is complicated. So it has been done only in very simple cases. So this is what I'm saying here. This can be done. And generally, you see that there is exponential. There, there is a lot of topological complexity. The real question is, does this really matter? as many seem to think. I'm very struck in this conference here and in every other, that when people talk about optimization, they say, of course, an algorithm will, can get stuck in a local minimum. And that, of course, is bad, bad, bad. In those cases, this is completely an unimportant question. This is not what happens. Okay? Nobody cares if you look at dynamically at this topological complexity. Okay, so I'll see, I'll tell you why. So, because in fact in high dimension there is another problem which is more pressing than the topological complexity. That's the entropy, which I mentioned before, like in tensor PCA, you start at random, escaping this zero, this bad region, which is a region where you have, your estimator is very bad, the, the equator is very hard because this region is very large. Right? Again, it's as if the equator on the, on the, on the planet Earth did 99.99999% percent of the surface. Right? Which is not the case. But in high dimension, it is the case. Everything is at the equator. At the equator of any vector you want, by the way. So, the problem here, this escaping entropy, is the problem of finding a needle in a haystack. So what is finding a needle in a haystack? Very simple. You are, let's say, again, let's, let me take the sphere. I could take the cube. The needle in a haystack usually is described with discrete things. So Philippe wanted discrete things. Uh, but let me, first, since I'm on the sphere, let's continue on the sphere. You have a sphere and you have a little tiny ball somewhere, a point that you want to find, maybe with a tiny ball around it. And you want to find it, but you don't know where it is. Right? That's the needle in a haystack. You start at random because you know nothing. So if your point is, let's say, the North Pole, you start on the equator because you start at random in high dimension. And now you explore randomly your sphere. So randomly, what does it mean to mean randomly? You take a random walk. You take a Brownian motion on the sphere. You explore. and You try to find this point. It takes exponentially, exponentially n times to do that. So the discrete version is you, you are on the vertices of the hypercube. You have a sequence of plus minus one to the n. You want to find one such configuration and you start at random and you just do a random spin flips until you find it. You need exponentially many of these. So it's super hard because you have to beat entropy. Again, the volume that you have to escape is exponentially large compared to the volume to where you want to go. So the time to do that is exponentially long. That's just, and here the landscape is totally flat. So you don't care about, there are no local minima, blah, blah, all that is not there. Just totally flat is still very hard. Now, you could ask yourself the question, okay, but here it's like pure noise. I have no information at all. So let's imagine, like in tensor PC, that I have, I'm just looking at x1 to the p, right? I'm, I'm, I don't even have the random part. So I have a gradient that pushes me there. Then it's very, it's still very, depending of course on the strengths of this gradient, it will be still very long to get there. Because the problem will be to escape the equator. Okay? So in general, for, for neural nets, it's what seems to happen. You have random initialization. Depending on your architecture, depending on your model, it may be hard or easy to escape this random thing. So for instance, if you do this problem I was just mentioning with a p equal one, it's trivial. With a p equal three, it's hard. 
the p equal two is critical. Okay, so it depends, and so if this depends on the this what we called in some of our work the information exponent, which is this p here, which is the following thing. When you so you have this thing in very high dimension, which in fact you only are interested in the projection in one dimension, the latitude. When you project your system in dimension one, then you, your gradient essentially you look at what the so if you start exactly at zero, your system will not move. You start near the equator at a small distance, one over root n here, and it will move. Of course, how much it moves depends on the structure of this uh, signal you have at the, the drift you have at zero, right? So this is this problem of escaping mediocrity, doing just a little bit better than random, is very often the hard thing. So this question is rampant. It's all over in the study of performance of an optimization algorithm. It's the question of cold start, that is random start versus hot start. If somebody tells you, you should, here is the northern hemisphere, you should go this way, then it's easy. Right? But again, this is a lot of information because the, the, the hemisphere, remember, are tiny. So, uh, in particular, this is hard if you want to study the optimization algorithm in short time. So every time you see a result saying not counting the number of steps, that's a problem. Because here, of course, if you give this thing exponentially many time steps, you will find this thing. But again, nobody runs an optimization algorithm for exponentially many steps. When if n is 10 to the 9, you don't run it for 10 to the 10 to the 9 steps. Right? So beating the entropy at insulation asks for a very, for a strong signal. And this is what explains this gap that I mentioned in the tensor PCA thing. This n to the p, n to the p minus two over two. This gap is explained by that. It's the difficulty of just doing something a little better than random. Once you've done that, then the rest is easy. Okay, so that's the hard things. The landscape can be very complicated topologically. The entropy keeps you stuck in the bad regions. So situation is bad. Except, of course, that Situation is good because everybody uses this thing. So this type of thing is supposed to work. So why does it work? Of course, here I had the typical attitude of a theoretical computer scientist or a mathematician, a pure mathematician, proving that things can't work. Right? So let's try to see that things can work. So uh, here's my the, the, what I call the low rank hypothesis. The, my hypothesis here, if a system like SGD for optimization for a neural net works in very high dimension. So I have, every time I, I discuss this with students, I have two numbers. Very high dimension is 10 to the 9. Then the system must in fact work in, in fact in a much smaller dimensional space, which it chooses on its own. You don't necessarily know what this smaller dimensional space is. Possibly after an initial phase of escaping mediocrity. So you have an initial phase which can be complicated. Once you begin to feel the signal, you work in a much smaller dimensional space. Typically, for me, it's small dimension is 17. So which means that there is, exists at every point. In the, so you look at the trajectory of optimization in your big space here, my sphere when I was in tensor PCA. There is a subspace at every point. There will be a subspace... So the tangent space to your manifold is dimension 10 to the 9. But in fact, there is a subspace of, of small dimension, k, let's say 17, such that the projection of your dynamics on this subspace is almost autonomous. Of course, when you take an ODE, a differential equation in general, and you project it, it's of course not autonomous. So here I'm saying, my hypothesis is that when things work, when you have chosen a good architecture, it's precisely because, in fact, the system finds this small dimensional projection that will, in fact, do what you want to do. That is, minimize the, uh, the, 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 the loss. So this k, but the, now you have a projection, an autonomous dynamical system in dimension k, 17. So, but this k-dimensional dynamical system, so, of course, in my example of tensor PCA, k was 1. It was just the latitude. That's the only thing you needed to measure. In general, k can be larger. And this dynamical, as soon as you have a dynamical, a dynamical system in dimension one is easy. A dynamical system in dimension 17 may be complicated. 
Right? So this dynamical system may have traps, wells, all sorts of things like that, and, for, and these are important. But remember, you have 17 dimension, and in each fiber you have 10 to the 9 minus 17 dimension. Right? In this direction, it should be much flatter. In this direction, that's where the real action takes place. So, of course, this system can be complex, and it can and it depends on the point along the trajectory, and it depends on the step size. Okay. So the way to think of it, of course, again, I will try to. I cannot exactly with my hands show you dimension ten to the nine, but formally, it means that you should think of this uh, function as a space of dimension seventeen, where it's kind of curved, and the rest where it's kind of flat. 10, 10 to the 9 minus 17, where it's kind of flat, so it moves. So this thing is essentially autonomous. Of course, it's not as simple as that. This direction can be like that too. All right. So, interestingly, I received two days ago this paper. So you see January 2024, which is called, and I have nothing to do with the, these colleagues, which is called the Low Rank Hypothesis of Complex Systems. Nature of Physics, by a bunch of French physicists, which says exactly the same thing. If a complex system in physics has any interest, it must have a, a low-rank projection autonomous somewhere. And the way they think of it is the same as what we're going to do right now. So this is the low-rank hypothesis that I put forward here. So these projections, when they exist, so we've studied that with, the, I mentioned this paper, uh, we call them summary statistics. And so this is what I, uh, has been discussed in the more technical talk last week, but not every one of, uh, of you were there. And their dynamics, when they are autonomous, are called effective dynamics. So in this recent paper with Okoshaganat and Reza Geisari, we're given sufficient condition for the existence of such things in a kind of Bourbaki way, right? That is abstract nonsense thing. If this, 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 then you have this thing. And of course, we illustrated that with a simple example. For instance, with the classification of an XOR problem with two layers, traditional problem of, uh, of uh, machine learning in a simple case. And there we saw that in this context, so you had four classes. Now I, I, I do not pretend that you don't know what XOR is. I'm sure you do. Then uh, and you're, you have this two-layer classification thing. The, in fact, the, these effective dynamics were in dimension 14. And you had, and the dynamical system was complicated. You had 695 critical regions. And the probability that your generalization error, to come back to that, when you start at random, the probability that in short time, not exponential time, you reach a small generalization error, you reach a good conclusion, your system works, was three out of 32, right? So it was finite. And when you did over parameterization, when you increase the last layer, this probability went to one. So this dynamical system rules the day, not the one in dimension 10 to the nine, but the one in dimension 14. Okay. I won't go back to that. Let me go further. Then this emergence of a low rank system ruling the very high dimensional optimization can be seen from a spectral point of view. So this is this last paper of 23 with the same author plus uh, Zhao Yang Huang. There, what is this spectral point of view? This is the same thing that this physicist argue for mentioning this. So once it escapes mediocrity, the system finds this autonomous low-dimensional projection on its own. And this dim low-dimensional projection, you don't, in the example I was mentioning in XOR, how did we find this projection? Just because it was clear that it, it was a nice thing to try. The distribution was kind of explicit. Right? So it was, if you want expert knowledge, you didn't need to be very expert. You just look at the problem. But if you don't know, your system is too complicated, you don't know anything, it finds on its own this direction, and what are they? They are given by the eigenspaces. So you look at the spectrum, let's say, of the Hessian along the trajectory, and what you see is that this, so this spectrum, this Hessian has 10 to the 9 eigenvalues. And what you see, of course, is that this 10 to the 9 eigenvalues are, gives you a big blob, which you don't want to study, 
The spectrum is not a semicircle or something kind. It's some mess, but for which, which you don't care, because you have outliers, which are, in fact, much bigger. So much, if you think of the Hessian, it means that this is, your function is much more curved in those directions, right? If your Hessian is small in 10 to the 9 minus 17 direction and high in 17 direction, it means in this 17 direction it's very curved. And if you just look at this eigenspaces, the 17 dimension, then the, 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 the dynamics in this direction is essentially autonomous, which is not a big surprise. Because this tells you, in, at least in this scale, the function is essentially a function of those 17 variable. Its second derivative in terms of the other is very small. If a function is essentially a function of this 17 variable, when you look at the gradient flow, it should essentially be autonomous. So this is exactly what this paper were. So of course, it's hard random matrix theory, but it's what it proves. And in fact, of course, this is not very cool because it's, uh, it's uh, what I'm saying here, it's a second order thing. Right? And nobody wants in dimension 10 to the 9 to compute Hessians. But in fact, you could use the Fisher information uh, matrix, which is one or the one, which is, so what is that? You take the, you had to compute the gradient along the trajectory. You take your gradient all along the trajectory, create the gram matrix, I mean, the gram matrix, this matrix time uh, is transposed, and it, the same thing happens. When this transition is formed, the dynamics happen. The, the eigenspace, the outlier eigenspace for the gram, for the information matrix is the same as for the Hessian. So this corresponds to the dynamical version of the BBP phase transition in random matrix theory. And we illustrate that, that so. An interesting thing is that this, emer this emergence of these outliers where the dynamics really concentrates and become interesting can be gradual. The rank of these effective dynamics can be deficient. Let me explain. So, for instance, we treat that in the case of, a, of a classification of, of K Gaussians. Right? So, you have a mixture of K Gaussian. It could very well be that initially, so let's say you have uh, 17 Gaussians, that initially the outliers are only of dimension 5. And then maybe later they will be of dimension 7. And then maybe later of dimension 12, and then maybe later of dimension 17. So why would that be? Let's imagine, okay, let's, let's say that, let's say you have four classes. It could be that you have two classes very close and two classes very close. Then you will see two outliers only. And then when you go deeper, you will see the difference between these two and you will see four outliers. Right? So these, this thing is not, first, it's not constant on the trajectory and it can, it can, in fact, uh, be gradual. So we did that on purpose. We did that on the case of classification of K Gaussians because there were numerical experiments for that. And we see this picture very clearly. We see, for instance, that the Hessian has those outliers, even if you take layer-wise Hessians. So this whole structure is there. Of course, the real question is two, two folds. So first, what I just said is an hypothesis. I am given the effort you need to do one example. Um, maybe I need first year students to take that and do it again because, or maybe somebody to understand the general principle that would make that to happen. The other thing is, but I still believe that if you don't have this type of dynamical spectral thing, your system will not work. So the other thing is, this allows you to understand also how you escape mediocrity. Here I'm describing, in fact, a very form BBP transition, where you have a, the bulk of your spectrum and outliers very far. But the, BB, the real spectral transition, the real BBP transition, is really to understand how the, the outliers emerge from the bulk. And that, is, that corresponds exactly to escaping mediocrity. If you take the tensor PCA example, then in this case you exactly have this, your spectrum is, in fact, a semicircle, and you have one outlier coming out. In fact, there is a situation where you have the uh, rank 1 deformation, but the spectrum doesn't see it. That corresponds to being below the IT threshold. Then at some point, it comes out. 
And when it comes out, it's exactly when you begin to escape the equator. Precisely. And the important thing in, the, in this BBP transition is not when it's fully formed, is to understand how this happens, how the outlier eigenvector begins to be non-uniform, non-standard. And this is understood in simple cases. Right? So there is a possibility here to really understand how the equivalent of what was called the index, the information exponent. What measures the way with which you escape the random nonsense, right? And this is also spectral, all right? So I believe that this would happen in, uh, in many more cases. Uh, I think my uh, collaborators are tired of that, so please be my guest. So now I finish with, the, that was, all that was about sampling, a few words about hallucinations. So that's just for, I, 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 I mentioned that just because I love the word. When I saw that people were talking about hallucinations, I thought this is great. So, so we've talked about estimation here, learning, but not sampling. So what about sampling? So there are many ways to define the task of sampling, as I mentioned before, depending on what information you have. So let, let's consider the way artificial intelligence generative models work. So you start with some data, you have a small sample, and you want to create a larger one, right? Sample new points. But not by doing a random experiment, but not by tossing the coin again, but just by looking at what you have and just generating more. So these generative models are the topic, of course, of much debate today, as you know. And again, the high dimensional nature of this makes this very hard and interesting to study mathematically. In finite dimension, this is not that hard, but here it's complicated. So. What is the wor the general worry? I mean, you, you've seen probably that the atmosphere is not extremely favorable to that. People are scared. That's why they call it hallucinations. So if this generating AI is generate, so first question, you, you have a small sample in very high dimension. You want to generate more points. So there are plenty of methods. I won't come back. This whole week is concerned by that. Most of the speakers in the room here are better expert than I am on this uh, sampling thing. So uh, if, if your generative thing generates a point which is too close to something you already have in your data point, then this is plagiarism. So this, we, we, during, I mean, during the conference here, we just got this fantastic example, which was given to us. So you see it's very recent, December 27. And you have this article in the New York Times, the Times sue OpenAI and sues OpenAI and Microsoft over AI use of copyrighted work. And we've seen, I won't do that here, how this OpenAI says, we just generated new points, and the points they generated was like an almost exact copy of what, of articles of, of the New York Times. As if, you know, some of your students say, no, no, it's a new point, but I just took my neighbor's copy and, and, uh, so this is bad. So generating a, a sample which is very close to what you already have doesn't bring much information. Intuitively, we don't like it, and we don't like plagiarism because it doesn't bring anything. The next thing is they can, they can generate something which is in very high dimension, again, very different from what we know. So then we may be surprised. This is too different. It doesn't look, I wanted an image. You know how it works, generally. You ask, I want the picture of two dogs underwater smoking pot, right? And uh, whatever crazy stuff. And then, you know, if this doesn't look like dogs to you, then you say, this is not good. So if this is too far, complicated. But then there's another way, which is if it can generate a point close to what we know, that feels familiar, so it looks like, okay, or a decent picture, but sufficiently different. So not an exact copy of a paper by uh, the New York Times. Something that sounds like a, a, an article by the New York Times, but when you read it, for you, it doesn't make sense, right? So we feel strange. We, this looks like it's not real. So then this is when they say that the system hallucinates, okay? So, of course, you see here that the real problem is a problem of metric again. How do we evaluate? What is the, so we generate, but with what criteria? What do we want to do with it, right? So if you had said, I want to generate something uh, which looks like an article of, of New York Times, but which is not an article of, you know, not too close, so that's one thing. If you say, I want to, to, to do something that seems 
to have some sense, it's another thing, right? So all that is, of course, we are very far from understanding all that. So the question now, then I will conclude with that, is it good or bad for artificial intelligence to hallucinate? This is a very deep philosophical question, right? We've learned things, we have this, and then suddenly comes another example. Why do we, why do we say that this doesn't look real? In fact, the way we, the, the metric with which, we, with which we evaluate that is very deeply related to the human experience on a long, long time scale. So we look at that and it would be very hard to say why is it good or not good? Why is it an hallucination? So the machine does not know that. So again, there is a meta thing to be done here. So is it good or bad for, it could be good for artificial intelligence to hallucinate, to give us something that is kind of real, but really, really different. It would create for us like a, a new experiment, experience as a, humans. But, uh, you know, of course, there's something else that we tend to, to trust things. And suddenly we can't, right? When we have, and we are very much threatened psychologically by things like that. If you see that it's plagiarism, you say, okay, pff, easy. You see something completely crazy, you say, okay, but something that seems reasonable but doesn't feel real, then we are shaky. So, but it could be very good. So, is it good or bad? Who knows? I don't know. All right? That's, uh, and so with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, let's thank Professor Ben Alus again for a fascinating lecture. And I, uh, we have a small mystery gift. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Let me look at it. <laughs> okay, so that uh, concludes this uh, evening's uh, public lecture. Thank you very much for.